Good morning and welcome, and thank you for being uh, so prompt and on time for this teaching session. <laughs> um, I think uh, Andres will introduce himself in, in, in a slide, so I will not uh, take up that, uh, that time. Well, probably worth introducing why uh, we thought of this teaching session. Um, I think a lot of us have been interested in the historical rate of mortality improvement and how do we forecast them. But without tools, uh, it's very difficult for us to, to smooth historical data and understand the mortality improvement rates, the, the, the evidence that we are we're having, uh, that the evidence of historical rates. Um, at the same time, and without good tools, we can't really forecast them, look at different scenarios of the various uh, good and existing models around. And what this teaching session will do is, um, is that Andreas has spent quite a, amount, a lot of time actually simplify and collate different tools and wrote them in a free statistical software. And, and what we hope to achieve today is that we can be introduced to this software so that actuaries can get their hands dirty, download data, and, and just use this software to project, uh, uh, to, to analyze historical rates and project uh, mortality improvement rates and death rates for any countries and any populations they're interested in, provided you have the data in the right format. Um, I'll pass the time to Andres. Thank you. So thanks, Joseph, for the introduction and for the invitation to, to run this, this session. So if you're interested in following some of the slides that, that, I, that I have, you can download them now here. Also, if you're interested in the code that I use for developing the slides, all of that is freely available there in case you are interested. So, so as Joseph said, I'm going to talk a bit about mortality modeling in R. Uh, the, ter the term mortality model is very wide, so I'm going to concentrate on what we call stochastic mortality models. And this draws from some work I I've been doing over the past three, four years, where with some colleagues at Cass Business School, we have developed uh, an R package for stochastic mortality modeling. So the aims of the session, since uh, I'm an academic, and then when you start a class, you should convey what you're aiming to achieve. So what we plan to do is, I, I will try to give you a bit of familiarity with R packages that can be useful for modeling mortality. So I'm going to start with demography, which is going to be useful for downloading data from the human mortality database. Then we're going to move to San Momo, which is the package we have developed, which allows for the stochastic, for doing a stochastic mortality modeling in R. And then I'm going to briefly try to do some, some, show you how you can use this to feed a stochastic mortality rates, compare the goodness of feed of mortality models, forecast future mortality rates. And then there is another package which is called Life Contingencies that has been developed by, by Giorgio Spedicato from Italy that we can integrate to compute demographic and actual quantities. So with that in mind, the agenda, I'm going to try to divide this into three parts. We'll see how far we get. So the first one, I'm going to do a bit of motivation and a review of mortality modeling methodologies. So that we're not going to talk about R yet. After that, we talk about R. And then I'm going to concentrate on how we can translate those techniques into mortality modeling with R using demography, said Momo, life contingencies. And then I'm going to conclude. And then if there are already users of San Momo, so I, if time permits, I'll do a preview of the things that, might be, that, that will be coming up in the next six months and what is in the plan of development of the software. So since this is a teaching session, that if at any time you have a question, just, just let me know and just go to the microphone and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to, 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 to clarify anything that's necessary. Okay. So let's start a bit with the motivation and review of mortality modeling. So the first question is, why do we need to do mortality modeling? So what we have seen is that there has been uh, recent trends have shown that mortality has been declining, life expectancy has been improving. It happens ar around all of the world. And this is good news because, I mean, we, 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 it shows the, prog the, the, the progress of society. However, this can have important consequences for government, insurers, individuals. And we need to model and project these trends so that we can prepare for the future, right? So in the recent times, there has been lots of interest in developing mortality projections. So 
to develop mortality projections, uh, you can think of mainly three broad ways or three approaches that, that people can use. If you're interested in this, uh, there is a very good book by Hermano Pitaco, Stephen Haberman, uh, Ana Maria Olivieri, and Michel Denui, which is an introduction of mortality modeling for annuity applications. So, so, so if you're in this, in this business, I think that's a good book to have on, on, uh, for consultation. And there are also some articles that, that are good introductions. So all of that is at the end of, in, the, in the reference sec section that you can use later on. So we can think of mainly three ways of doing mortality projections. So one is expert-based, and, and that will entail like asking experts about what are their views about where mortality is going. And, and, and a lot of that is embedded in what uh, about what national statistical offices do. For instance, they ask, hey, what do you think is the long-term improvement rate? And then we do a way of converging to that. We can also have explanatory models where we want to explain how mortality is changing and trying to use like information, maybe economic information or cause of that information and, and try to use that for, 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 for doing uh, projections. And there's extrapolation, which is basically looking at the regularities of the past and trying to do trend modeling. Today, I'm going to concentrate and many of the techniques we, we use are based on extrapolation. And that's because even though expert-based and explanatory models sounds very appealing and they're very good for understanding what has gone, what's going on, typically when you look at accuracies, they don't, they, 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 they don't do as well as extrapolation models. But there's benefits in doing all of them, but today we're going to concentrate on extrapolation. So let me give you a timeline of what has happened in terms of developing of extrapolation models in both the actuarial and demographic literature. So a lot of this work they started by, by the Lee Carter by, by the Lee Carter model in, in the in the 90s. So in that model, it became like the gold standard for doing mortality projections. And after that, it spawned a lot of interest in, in the demographic literature, the actuarial literature, and a lot of developments have come up. So after some time, then people started enhancing that model, for instance, by adding cohort effects or by making it uh, instead of using one-time trend, using two-time trends, three-time trends. And then there was another important development, which was the introduction of the keynes blake doubt model in 2005. And that also spawned a lot of extensions, so adding cohort effects to the CBD model. We'll come back to the specifics of these models in a minute. But before that, there was also the age period cohort model, which to the to actuaries, it seems like it came up to their interest in, 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 in the early 2000s. But this is a model that has been there for a long time in demography, epidemiology, sociology. And more recently, what people have started doing, instead of modeling single populations, so we know that populations tend to move together, or we want to understand how populations in, in di different regions or are uh, evolved or different socioeconomic groups or uh, different states, and then we want to use multi-population models. And more recently, the focus of these models has been always about modeling mortality rates, but in actuarial science, we normally overlay improvement rates onto a base table, so there has been also several developments in terms of modeling improvement rates. And more recently, people have started using statistical learning techniques to apply mortality models. And in parallel to that, all of these techniques are what we call discrete time mortality models, but there have also been developments in continuous time mortality models, which use analogies with financial techniques to be able to develop mortality models that can be easily integrated with the pricing of, of, of life of, of contingent, of life contingent uh, uh, products or derivatives. We're going to concentrate on this part. So let me do a bit of an overview of what has happened. So in 1982, Licard introduced the model, and then people started enhancing it. So for instance, uh, Range and Haberman added more terms into that, into that model. They also introduced a cohort effect, and this model has become rather popular. And Keynes Blake and Dow in 2006 introduced the two-factor CBD model. And then they also extended it to add cohort effects, add quadratic age terms. These things will become clearer in, in, in a minute. And then also people start combining the features of both of them. And if you go and read actuarial papers mainly, you see that there are many other papers that, that, that try to use this, these ideas. And, and, and this, in a way, became like, if you, if you, follow, if you follow the literature five or six years ago, 
every other week you will see a new paper coming up with adding a new term and adding another thing. And, and so before we go to that, let's, let me explain like the basics of some of these models. So let's start with the, with the Lee Carter model. So to, to understand that, let's look at mortality rates in the US. So what we have here is mortality rates in 1933. So this is age, and this is the log that rate. And then what you see is what you expect, like high mortality at infant ages, then a bit of an accident harm, and then more or less linear, log linear mortality increase by age after age 40 or 50, right? So let's see how it changes over time. So if we go and move, we see that mortality is going a bit up, down, might be going a bit up at some, in some times, but in general, it's going down, right? So we see as time passes by, mortality rates at different ages improve, and it might improve at different rates for different ages. We see a big decline in, uh, at infant ages, not such a big decline in older ages. So what the Lee Carter model wants to do, and many of the other mortality models want to do, is try to model this process. So how do they go about it? So if we take the log force of mortality, or the log central death rate, so what we do is we say, okay, this has a shape, so let's capture that. So we can say there's gonna be an alpha x or an h term that just captures how it evolves with age. So the fixed age, comp age behavior of mortality. But we also saw that mortality was declining, right? So we can add a time trend, a kappa t that captures that, right? But we saw that this change was not the same at all ages. So we might say we have this trend, but this improvement rates are at different paces for different ages, and then we get the beta x. So that's the basic about the Lee Carter. So you can estimate it, and then what you get is an alpha x, which captures that general shape, a kappa t that will be declining, and then this will show like, okay, mortality has been declining. If you look at the US data, we know that from 2010, this has been slowing down, so you see it more or less flat here. And you also see that different ages have been improving at different rates. So you see very high improvements uh, at, at younger ages, then also peak around age 70, right? So that's the, the basic idea. So now let's look at the other big, the other import, the, the other uh, key model in this, in this literature. So let's look at the CBD model. So in the CBD model, so Keynes, Blake, and Dowd, so what they notice is that if you concentrate in older ages, so let's go back here, so say after age 50 or 60, or more or less from here, this behaves more or less linearly. If you do it on the log in the in the QXT, you also see something, something similar. So why don't we exploit that fact? And then we have the log of QXT. Here we have, this is data for England and Wales in 1961. So this is the observed rates, more, uh, uh, more probabilities of that. So you see that they're more or less linear. So I say, okay, why don't I feed that line, right? On the log scale. So I can feed that line, and then I can record two things. If I have a line, I will have a slope, here, and we have an intercept. So let's record it. So this will be the intercept, this will be the slope, so this will capture what's the level of mortality, and this will capture the slope, so that will mean how different, different ages evolve, uh, improve with, with time, or how, how mortality changes with, 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 with age, right? So we do it in 1961, we might do it in 1962, so we get a, a bit of a change, so we get a different intercept, a different slope, we can keep recording those things, Right? And then we see, okay, mortality has been going down, so kappa t is going down. We also see that younger ages have been improving faster, so then you also see this slope changing like this, and it's captured by that, and we can keep recording it, and then this is what we get for the CBD model, right? So that's the basic idea. And then what people have done is, okay, ext let's extend this to try to capture other features that we might miss, and there is a list of many models that have been proposed. I here have a sample of them. So you have the Lee Carter. So you can, instead of having just one time trend, you have, can have two. You can add a cohort effect. You can have a more basic model, which will have an age, a period, and a cohort model. You have the CBD. I might say, okay, at older ages, this doesn't behave linearly, but it might have some quadratic behavior. So I might add a quadratic term here and also a cohort effect, and then I can combine features of both of them and then have that, and I can get creative and add whatever I want. And what, used, what, what happened in a lot of the literature is like, okay, I add another term, and I say, so this is my model, and then people get another paper. And, and yeah. So, bit. so more recently, given that there was this, this, the, 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 this plethora of models coming out, what people have tried to do 
is, okay, let's try to find the commonalities between them. And there are, uh, I think, three, three important papers there. So one is a paper by Hunt and Blake, where they propose what is called a generalized age period cohort model structure. So how can we integrate them into one single formula? There's also another key paper by, by Ian Curry, where they show that many of these models that we use for doing mortality projections, they are either generalized linear models or generalized nonlinear models. Therefore, we can draw on what we know about generalized linear models to be able to develop these models. And then, using these ideas, uh, we've developed an R package that can use these to be able to allow the implementation of many mortality, mortality models. So let me talk a bit about this generalized age period cohort a stochastic mortality model a structure. So if you are familiar with, with GLMs, so you, 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 you might be able to follow this easily. So if you have a GLM, you start by having a random component, right? And that is what do we assume about the distribution of deaths when we do the modeling. So we can assume either that the deaths follow a Poisson distribution, so we will model the central death rate, right? Or we might assume that the death rates follow a binomial distribution, right? So that's the first choice, typically. Therefore, then we will have what we call the systematic component, which will capture how mortality evolves. So that would be this formula. So in this formula, it's a bit of a generalization of what we saw before for the Lee Carter model, where we will have a fixed age term. You will have a number of age period terms. So you can have, not, in the Lee Carter, you have n equal to 1, or you can have it n equal to 2, n equal to 10, whatever you want. And then you can specify how the beta x look like. So if they are non-parametric, say you estimate it from the data, you recover what is a Lee Carter model. If you pre-specify them, then you recover a CVD style model. And then you can also have a cohort effect. Then you have the link function that just connects the random component, the systematic component, and typically this will be the logs, if you are using the Poisson distribution, just using the canonical link, or it can be the log it if you are using the binomial distribution. So in that setting, we're in the standard, in the, in the standard framework of generalized linear models, and they may be generalized nonlinear models if we have this beta x being non-parametric, because we will have bilinear models. But in the context of mortality models, there is also an additional thing that you need to do is that you need a set of parameter constraints because sometimes you can change the parameters to get the same rates but with different parameters. Say, for instance, you can multiply things here by a constant and then divide this by a constant and then you get the same. This can get a bit tricky, so I'm not going to go too much into the details of that. And then in a mortality model, the objective in many cases is to do projections. So you need to specify how you're going to model the time indexes, so the things that depend on t. The things that depend on t here are the kappa t's and the gamma t's, right, which are the cohort effects. So you need to specify how you're going to model. So the standard thing to, that, you can, that, that normally people do, also you can do more complicated things, so you can assume that the kappa t's follow a random walk with drift, and for the cohort effects, people usually assume that they follow an ARIMA style process. Okay. So, so that's what the quick introduction on mortality modeling. So this is a good time for asking questions if you, if you have any clar clarifications about what I have talked so far. Okay. Okay. So feel free to stop me later if you, if you do one, if you do have a, a question. So now let's see how can we translate this into doing it in R. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to illustrate this with a US data example. From now on, it's going to be a lot of coding, but hopefully it's simple. And this is just to give you an overview, but I hope that you get interest to try to, to, to do this at home later with, with, with your own data or for other populations. Okay. So, what is out there for doing mortality modeling in R? So the first package that is available is the package demography developed by, by, by Rob Hyman from Monash University with some colleagues from, from, from ANU and and also Macquarie University in Australia. So this package allows you to easily download data from the human mortality database, which is one of the first things you need to do, get the data. And then it also allows you to implement several Lee Carter model and some extensions. This is mainly focused on demographic extensions of the Lee Carter, right? So we'll look a bit, a, a bit into that. So there is also the ILC package developed by, by, by uh, Sultan 
uh, but, uh, Steve Haberman and, 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 and Halin Shang, this is from CAS Business School, where they implement the leak carton motor with cohort effects and also the leak carton motor with, with, with doing estimation under a Poisson setting. Sorry, can I? Yep. When you say demography, it means you when you go to R. Yep. So there's a word called demography, so that is a package. Yeah, exactly. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go into, into how you go uh, okay. into, into installing that. Yep. And there is also the life metrics group of, of, of functions. It's not an R package, but a group of functions that a lot of people use and, and, and used to use in the past, but some people still use it. They are available in, in, in Andrew Kern's website. And this is what they use when JP Morgan developed their life metrics suite of, 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 of tools for mortality risk modeling. And that implements the CVD and extensions, the leak added with cohort effects, and, the, and, and under a Poisson framework. And now is the package we have developed, which is called San Momo, which implements the generalized age period cohort models and tries to integrate some of the things that they do and try to overcome some of their limitations. In particular, allowing to be extended to new models, doing easy comparison between models, and also doing easy projections and simulations. Okay. So to install a package in R, what you do, you just go install packages, you type the name, these are the three packages I'm going to use today. So you will go install the package, demography, send Momo, life contingencies. And then if you want to use them within an R session, then you just go, I want to use the library demography, the library send Momo, and the library life contingencies. So let's see how we can use all of these to analyze mortality data for the US. So the first thing is to go and get the data. So where are we going to get the data from? So we're going to get the data from the human mortality database. And the human mortality database is an excellent uh, uh, endeavor by the Max Planck Institute and, and the people in the demographic uh, department at Berkeley, where they consistently collect data for 39 countries with consistent data and consistent protocols in terms of how, you, how they treat them. So this is very useful for doing cross-country comparisons. And if you want to use it, you need to go there, register, and you get a password, right? And then you can download the data in terms of mortality rates, populations, uh, by period, by cohort, by five years age band, by one year age bands. And some recent developments that I, I think are, are key and, and are very important for the future development of what we do as actuaries is there have been national uh, efforts to develop sub-regional versions of the HMD. So, so there is the US Human Mortality Database which contains data by state, following the same protocols as the, as the human mortality database. There is also a Japanese version, which contains patients uh, by prefectures, I think they are called in, in Japan. There is another version in Australia by, by state, and there is a Canadian version of the human mortality database. And, and I know there are efforts to produce similar sub-regional uh, versions of the HND for other countries. So keep an, keep an eye on that. For this example, we're going to use US data. This is not right. This is from 1968 to 2017, but we'll see that. So let's see how we go about downloading the data from the, from the human mortality database using demography. So let's assume that you have already gone to this web page. You have registered yourself. So you can just go. I'm going to use the library demography. I'm going to get, there's a function called HMDMX because it's going to download rates. So you say what country you want, in this case is the USA, you have your username, your password, and then you get it, in this case you have mortality data. Here is Austria, but it's US. I didn't update that part, but in that case it will be from 1933 to 2017, and, 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 and from ages 0 to, to, to 10, to, to 110. Right. So you'll see that I'm using a version that I used before in Australia, so there might be some things that still say Australia. This is now US. <laughs> so from demography, once I've downloaded them, I can plot the data. So very easily, I can just say plot US data. This has data for males, females, and combined populations. But I can say I just want the male data. So then I get this, and this is what they call a rainbow plot, where you see like how mortality has been declining. So you see, in the 1930s, it was rather high, and now it's slow. And you also see a bit of overlap from 2010 to 2017 because of the 
decline in the improvement, improvement rates. And you can also plot them in terms of time. So this was fixing age, log rates, and each of the lines representing a calendar year. But now you can have different, uh, this would, should be time, this would be different years, and each of the lines represents an age, right? So what you get here is just how they evolve through time. So you see uh, this should be the older ages, and you see how they have been declining, and then you see the, the other ones in, in a log scale. So it's very easy to, to get a sense of, of, of how the data are looking. And then you should do, always do this to see whether there are strange things, right? Okay. So now we have the data. Once you have the data, you want to model it. And we're going to model it with the package SendMom. But before we go to talk about the package, I just want to ask you a question. So do you know who is Momo? Some people know because they've seen this presentation before, but don't tell them. <laughs> Any clues? So where is Momo? Do you eat Momo? Or? Okay. So Momo is the king of the carnivals in Barranquilla. I'm Colombian, and also in many South, South American countries, like in, you follow the, the carnivals in Rio, but in particular in Cartagena, we have Momo, which is the king of the carnivals, and there is a very nice story about Momo, which is related to mortality, but in a nice way. So the carnivals, they are a lot of fun, so people have parties, and it's like a week of, 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 of very nice time, but when they finish, they finish with a funeral. So, and what happens is it's another character which is called Joselito, and Joselito dies, so everyone is sad because he dies, but the good thing is every year he rises again from the death, and then you have another carnival. So that's the name. So it's stochastic mortality modeling, but it's, it's from there. Okay. So now let's see about how one uses San Momo to do mortality modeling. So let me give you an overview of the functions that we have and what they do. So as I said, this package is based on the generalized age period cohort framework of mortality models. So that's the theoretical underpinning of the development. So in that setting, what we have is that the different models that we have in the literature, they are members of this family of models. So you can have the Lee Carter model, the Range 1 Hayburn model, the APC model, the CBD, and its extensions. But you can also have a general a stochastic mortality model you wish you, where you can create your own models that might come up in the literature or adjustments that you might need to do, right? So you create an abstract object which represents a generalized age period cohort models. Once you have a model, what you need is data, right? So you get some data, then you fit the model to data. Once you have fitted the model or multiple models uh, to the data, what you want to do is, okay, I want to plot it to see how the parameters look like. Then I want to analyze its goodness of fit, so then I can analyze its residuals and maybe get information criteria as well about them. And then once I've chosen a model or a set of models that I want to use, I want to forecast them because my objective is to get projections of mortality rates. And maybe I also want to simulate them because I not only want to get the central projection, but I might want to get projection intervals on, what I, on, 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 my, on my predictions. And then I might also want to plot the residuals and plot the forecast. I may want to also bootstrap the model I estimated to get a sense of parameter uncertainty. So what I'm going to do next, next is going to show you how you use all of this in, in, in analyzing mortality data from the US. Okay. So we have already downloaded the data. Now let's see what models I'm going to use for, for our example. So in our example, I'm just going to use four models. So I'm going to use the Lee Carter the age period cohort model, the CVD, and one of its extensions, which is called the M7 model, which has become very popular, especially in the UK. But you also see people using it for other countries. So that model will have a linear uh, 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 time trend, then a linear trend, a quadratic trend, and then a cohort effect. So for consistency, we're going to assume that we're going to use a Poisson distribution targeting the force of mortality using the log dead traits. So this is how we have them, all of them, in the same framework. So now let's see how you define these models in San Mom. So what you will have to do in R, you say, OK, I'm going to define a Lee Carter model. So I say I use the LC function to define the model. I want to define a CBD with log link 
Traditionally, the CBD model was proposed using the logit link, so that's why I'm specifying here that I'm going to use a log version of it. I'm going to use the APC model. I'm going to use the M7 model also with a log link. And then what you get, okay, I have LC is a Poisson model with these predictors. So this is what you get in the output in R once you run it. So I have the log of the force of mortality is going to be AX beta 1X kappa T1. In the case of the CBD, the MX is going to be kappa 1, kappa 2, but kappa 2 is going to be multiplied by something, and this F2 will be just this function, right? X minus X bar. So this is pre-specified inside. And then you get the same for the other models, and you can also have more complicated models if you want. So once you define the models, then the next step is to fit them to data. So let's see how we will fit them to the US data. So the first thing we have to do is we already downloaded our data from the human mortality database. Remember that it had multiple series. It had data for males, females, and the total population. So I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to use data from the US, but only males. So I get a US male data object. Once I have it, I say, OK, I have my Lee Carter. Right? I want to feed the Lee Carter to the US data. And then when I want to plot it, and then I get these parameters. So let's try to see what we, what we get there. So the data for the US is from 1933 to 2017, from A0 to 110, I think. So what we see is, OK, the usual shape of mortality at older ages. Uh, you need to be careful about what you get, because the, the data after 100 is it's, it, 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 it's it's not the data that we observe, but the human mortality database has a protocol to extend the day to harmonize the data after a certain age. And we see that mortality has been declining, especially it started declining at a different pace from around 1968, right? And you also see their different ages improving at different times, right? So that's as simple as that. But you might want to fit the, day, the model to different ages or different years, right? For instance, in this case, it might make sense to only fit it from 1968, because it's where we have a different trend. So let's see how we will go about fitting the model and the other models. So let's say I'm going to do a pension application. So I'm only interested in the behavior of mortality at older ages. So let's say I just want to fit the model to ages 60 to 89. So say I want to fit the model to 60 and 89, and I'm going to use only data from 1968 to 2017, because because of this change break, right? So if I want to fit it, I just say, OK, I want to fit the Lee Carter to US data, to these ages, to these years. And if I want to do the same for the other models, it's exactly the same. The only thing I need to change is the model I fit, right? So once you do that, the next step is to analyze the parameters. So now let's plot them. So you just say, I want to plot the Lee Carter. And then what we get here is now the alpha x looks rather linear because it's only from age 60, right? And we also see that we only have kappa t from 1968, where we see a very linear behavior, right? Which is one of the appealing things of using the, the Lee card, and is why it has become also very popular. When you look at the kappa t, it looks rather linear, so it means it's easy for extrapolation. And for the beta axis, we see here that it seems like improvements have been faster around age 70, 75, right? Okay. What about the APC? So you can do the same, you just plot, you say plot the APC, and these are just some things to not plot other things, but you can have a look at that later. And then what we see is the alpha X in this case, again, very similar to what we had. We have a kappa T that also shows the decline in mortality, but now we have a cohort parameter. And if we want to read this cohort parameter, what we see is like here in the interwar cohort, we see like this decline, which implies that they have been improving a bit faster than the other cohorts surrounding them. So sometimes it's a bit tricky to understand cohort effects, but, but this is pretty much what it, what it tells you. Right? Okay. We can do the same for the CBD. What we get, again, general mortality has been declining. After 2000, it was very clear that younger ages were improving faster. Here there is a bit of a reversal in that thing, which means that Maybe older ages now are improving at a, some ages are improving at a faster pace, so the, the change has not been like this, but a bit more like this after that. Right. Okay. So once you fit the model, 
the next thing is, okay, I want to choose from all of these models which one I should use, right? And in any model, in any model in application, one thing you want to check is, okay, does my model fit the data correctly, or is it capturing all of the features of my data? So if you are familiar with GLMs, what we use is the deviance residuals, right? In generalized nonlinear models, you also use the deviance residuals. So we can compute the deviance residuals which have this expression. The important thing here is the sign of the predictions, whether I'm overestimating or underestimating, which would be this part, and this will tell, give me a bit of a magnitude of the under and overestimation. And normally, or typically these things, if the model is correct, this should have sort of a normal distribution, right? So what you do, you can compute them. So to compute them is rather easy. I just get the models that I fitted. I just say I want the residuals. So you compute them, right? So the next thing after you compute them, in mortality modeling, a lot, a lot of the decision between choosing a model or another is a bit ad hoc. So you look at graphs, and then from the graphs you decide which model you use. So you can plot those residuals, and you can have plot them in different ways. So let's say I want to plot the residuals for the Lee Carter. So I said I want to plot the Lee Carter residuals. I want a color map, and I just want this scale to be from minus three to three because I know that they are, they are supposed to be normal, so, 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 so that should be the range where they lie, right? So let's see, and then what you get is a graph like this. So let's try to, 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 to see how we read it. So, so this goes from minus three to three because I, minus 3.5 and 3.5 because of this is how I specified. So the colors will tell me whether I'm up or down. I always forget whether blue is overestimated or underestimated, but it, it doesn't matter too much. What, it, what it's important is whether you see patterns. So one thing that you see here, this is calendar year and this is age. So if you look at the diagonal, this will mean a cohort, right? So you see here that for these cohorts, there seems to be a bit of a cohort effect. I am also may not be estimating correctly things here, right? So I might be able to improve the Lee Carter. If I look at the APC model, there is still a bit of, of diagonals, but they are less clear, right? But now we have some age patterns, so you see like here, I might be underestimating. If I see horizontal things that go along the horizontal line, it means age patterns. If I see vertical things, it's period patterns. If I look at the CVD, you see it looks like rather bad here. Might not be capturing correctly something happening at age 80 before and after age 80. If I look at the M7, it keeps some of that, but it looks a bit more noisy, right? None of the model looks perfect, right? But out of them, maybe, maybe if I'm looking at Google Feed, I might use this one, right? It's a bit of, 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 of judgment on which one you use, right? The other thing you normally use to choose a model, if you are in a, oh, you can also plot the residuals in different manners. So another popular plot is what I call a scatter plot, where you plot the residuals against each of the different dimensions of the evolution of mortality. So age, calendar year, and year of birth, or cohort. So age period and cohort. So sometimes in those plots, the path has become clearer, right? So let's look at the CBD, at the CBD residuals. So I, to get that, it's just exactly the same, but I just say, instead of a color map, I want a scatter plot. And then here you see that if I plot them by age, you see that it seems like it's, it's uh, misestimated at younger and older ages because it's assuming that it's linear, but it seems to have a quadratic shape, right? So you see that here. You also see that at most recent years, it seems to behave not, not as good. And you also see here a bit of a cohort effect. It's not very clear, but, but there might be some patterns by cohort. But by contrast, if you look at the M7 model, right, you see there here that we didn't see so many patterns. By looking at the scatter plot, again, you see these H effects are not there anymore because we introduced a quadratic trend that is now capturing that. By time, it also looks fine. And by cohort, because we now have a cohort effect, it seems, it seems right. So this can give you an idea where, which model one can use. Okay. Another thing that you normally use to compare models is computing information criteria, right? So you can have the AIC and the BAC. So the idea behind that is you can have your log likelihood, and then you penalize it by the number of parameters that the model has. In the case of the AIC, you just do twice. This V is the number of parameters. 
you just penalize by the number of parameters. And here you penalize by the number of parameters, but you multiply by the amount of data you have. So you can have a more penalization for not being parsimonious. So to compute that for this model, it's also rather easy. You just say, I have my CBD fit, for instance, and I just want the AIC. I get it. I want the BAC, and I get it, right? So I have computed it for all of them using exactly the same commands. And then what you get there, what you are looking here is for the smallest one. And according to this criterion, this is, seems to be the best model. So if I manage to get to the end, depending on what you're going to use your model for, uh, this might not be. Even though the BIC or AIC say it's the best because it seems like it's the best trade-off between goodness of fit and parsimony, maybe for projections, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, be the best. But we'll come back to that at the end if we have, if we have that. Okay. So I have fitted my models. I see, like, looks like the M7 is, is fine because it has nice residuals. Also, it looks like the APC might look fine. It's, all, it's, it's ranking second in terms of, 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 the, of, the, of the information criteria. It doesn't have two bad residuals, but it still has some patterns. So maybe I use them, but I want to compare all of them, right? So the next step, once I have fitted the model, is use them for projections, because maybe I want to compute, I don't know, life annuities for a particular cohort or life expectancies for a particular cohort. So to do that, what I need to do is model the parameters that depend on time. So in this case, this would be the kappa t. So, what, so the default in San Momo is to have a random walk with drift, which is what people normally use, but you have other options if you, if you, if you want. And for the cohort effect, we assume that it follows an ARIMA model. So that would be to, to model these, say, how this, this goes in time. And then for the kappa t, this looks rather linear. So a cohort, a, a random one with might be all right, but in not, not in all cases, but, but that's what people normally do. Okay. So for the cohort effects, since it's a general ARIMA model, you need to choose it, right? In this case, I have chosen it already. And I know that for the APC, an ARIMA 1, 1, 0 looks fine. And for M7, an ARIMA with 0 means. So just random noise seems to, to be fine. To choose that, you can use other packages in R, such as the forecast package. So there is a function called the auto ARIMA, and you can, you can use that. But let's assume I have already decided that. So what I can do to, to get forecast, in this case, let's assume I want to get projections for 30 years ahead. So if I'm going to get projections 30 years ahead for each of the models where I say, okay, I have my Lee Carter fit. I want to get proje projections for a horizon of 30 years. So I just say I want to forecast the Lee Carter for 30 years, right? And then I get a projection. In the case of the APC, I need to do a bit more. So I need to tell it, okay, I want to forecast the APC for 30 years. And for the cohort effects, I want to use an ARIMA that is 110 with a drift. So I'm in without a drift, so I'm not including the constant, right? Because I, couldn't, I could have with non-zero mean. Now, for the CBD, it's exactly the same as the Lee Carter, and for the M7, it's exactly the same as the APC because they have the cohort effects. But in this case, notice that I'm saying that the order is 0, 0, 1, and I'm also not including a constant. So once I do that, I can forecast them. I can see how the forecasts look like. So, for instance, for the M7 model, you see the projections look like this. So you have the kappa t going this way, this kappa t2 going that way. It might not be the best because we also saw this change. So there is an option to use an ARIMA model for that, where you could, might be better at capturing that. But you need to add a bit more parameters to be able to, to, to do that. The kappa t looks like that. And the gamma, the cohort effect, you see for this model, it looks rather more noisy. So that's why I chose uh, ARIMA 0, 0 without a constant. So it looks just like that. So once I get it, I can also do the same for other models. So for the APC, so this is what I, what I get. And I can do the same for, for the others. So with that, I can also not only be, I might not only be interested in getting central projections, but I might also want to get simulations of different mortality scenarios, right? That's one of the appealing things of using stochastic mortality models, because you may want to compute, I don't know, projection intervals, or if you are in, in a solvency calculation, you want to get like uh, different scenarios that you, that you, that you, that you, that you, that you, that might uh, depict the evolution of mortality. So to do that, 
to simulate your mortality evolution is also very simple. So again, I just want to simulate the Lee Carter. Let's say I want to do it, I want to get a thousand simulations and for a horizon of three years. And it's exactly the same for the, for the other models, except that for the ones that have a cohort effect, I need to specify how, I'm, how am I simulating the cohort effect. So once I do that, then I can plot the different simulations. So in the Lee Carter simulation object, so this one, so you will have different things. So one is the simulations of the kappa t's. So you can see like the period index in the kappa t could go like this. It could go up, down, and, and more favorable scenarios and less favorable scenarios. So, and then you can also do that to plot things like fun charts or confident or prediction intervals of, of mortality rates at particular ages. So here I have done it for age 65 in the Lee Carter and then I get this. Look that here it doesn't fit too well because we had this change in trend for the US after 2010. So that's not being captured by, by, this, by this model, right? So plotting this a bit more fitly than, than doing the others, but in, in the vignette of the package, you have all the code for doing that, so you can use it. So let's see what you will get in terms of projections for the different models. So, so I get the Lee Carter, APC, CBD, and M7. So one interesting thing to note there is that the projections, also they have some commonalities, they are also very different. So you see that the Lee Carter may have like not wide enough prediction intervals, right? It also might miss this behavior here, right? It starts like off where it should start. You see that the M7 seems to behave better, but not too dissimilar to the CBD. And if you had other models, you can get different patterns. So that's one of the key things about doing mortality projections. So you can choose a model, but what you get depends a lot on what model you choose. So it's very important to try different models and be conscious of the, of, of, of the model risk that you have in, in choosing these type of models. Right. Okay. So once you projected them, one of the objectives is to be able to get, say, cohort life tables for a particular cohort to be able to compute, say, life expectancies or annuity values. So let's see how you will go about it. So in these projections, in St. Momo, let's say we want to get projections of life expectancies for the cohort born in 1950, right? So this will be people age 67, 68 today. So let's say I have the rates. So I want that cohort. So I want my historical data, which will be here. So I want to say, OK, I want to get the rates for the 1950 cohort. So I choose that cohort. So this will be what they experienced up to, up to 19, uh, up to age 60. In 2000, and, uh, in the data I'm using for the fitting, I have already some data about them, especially when they were 60 to 67. So I can get that from the fitted data of my model, so what the Lee Carter fitted, right? So I can get that. I can also get the project, projections from the forecast, right, for that particular cohort. I can put them together. And then I can plot them, right? So I can just do a plot of that. So you see here, this up to here would be observed rates. This other part here would be fitted rates from the Lee Carter, and the red part would be the projected rates that I obtained from the Lee Carter, right? So I already have sort of a life table for the 1950 cohort with, I mean, if you only use the Lee Carter, it would be about 20 lines of, or even less than 20 lines of, of code, right? Okay. So once you have this, you may want to use it to compute life expectancies. So then that's where the package life contingencies becomes handy, right? So if you, if you haven't used the life contingencies package, this is a, an excellent package developed by Giorgio Pericato from Italy, and it allows you to construct life tables, use these life tables to compute demographic quantities, such as the LXs, the life expectancies, partial life expectancies, and you can then also con construct actuarial tables to compute, say, annuity values. You can also compute life insurance values, right? So in this case, I'm going to use it just to compute life expectancies curtailed life expectancies because I also, uh, partial life expectancy because I only have data until age 90 and I don't, I'm not extrapolating it beyond. So I'm assuming it's just the life expectancy until age 90 and assuming after age 90 everyone dies. So to do that, 
all I need to do in live contingencies, okay, what I fitted was recall that I was fitting a model on the central that rates, so I need to transform them to QXs. So I just say from go from central that rates to probabilities of dying of the rates that I already have. Then I'm gonna build a live table based on the probabilities, and this is of QXs, and then I'm gonna name it. This is a projection using the Lee Carter for the 1950 cohort. And then, based on that, I can compute quantities I want. So, for instance, I can compute the life, uh, the, the life expectancy at age 65, and then I get it's 17. This might be a bit low because we're assuming that everyone dies after age 90. I can do the, exactly the same for all of the models, and in this case, the differences are not that big. But if I were doing it for younger cohorts, the differences might be might be bigger. So there is a bit of, of, of moral risk there. Okay. So let me summarize up to this part. So, so what I've done is a whistle stop introduction to fit in mortality models in R. So if you are interested in, 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 in getting a bit more details about how to do these things, so the vignette of the package is, is here. So it has a lot of code, coding examples and a lot of the theory behind mortality models. So, so I think it's a good introduction if you, if you are interested. And there is also examples of how integrates and Momo with life contingencies in this vignette also developed by, by, developed by Giorgio. So you can have a, have a, look, have a look at that if you, are, if you are interested. So let me also talk about what San Momo provides. So it provides an easy implementation. So it allows people to do comparison of a wide range of models. So I think this, 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 this may be useful if you are analyzing longevity risk. In particular, I think it's important about model risk because as you saw, different models produce different projections. So I think it's important to try diff many different models and see how they behave. And hopefully this allows you to do that and also try new models that you want to propose for your data. If you are teaching R or mortality projection, this is very useful in class. So I use it with my students and, and they can get a handle on on these methods rather easily. And, but I also want to bring up that this is, using the standard packages is just the starting point, right? So, so we have these techniques that allow you to do these projections in 20 lines, but to go beyond this, you really need to understand what's going on. It's just not about putting in things and spitting things, things out, right? Okay. So there is some work in progress in San Momo. So for those that might already use it, so in the next, in the development, already available in the development version, which I expect to release in CRAN, like the updated version, public version in, in, in CRAN in the next six months, we have selection of models using cross-validation, because not usually the same model that is, fits well to the data might be the best one for projections. I, I, I think I have time to illustrate a, a bit of that. And then I also been working on using some statistical learning techniques to construct automatically the models. So, so this will be available. It's already available if you, if you want to use the development version. And also, as I show in the timeline, more recently, people have started using more frequently improvement rates. So there is a sister package which is called iMOMO, so improvement mortality modeling. And this is, the code is ready, but I'm not yet happy with the documentation to release it. So I, I expect to release it in the next year. And there are other development plans in the medium term. So one is to have a version that that's multi-population modeling. I already have a student line up to do that. Hopefully he'll deliver. And, and another one about model combinations. So we saw that different models produce different forecasts, so it might be wise to instead of using one single model, use a combination of models for doing the projections. So since we have time, so let's talk about these two developments, right? Until what time do we have, Joseph? And that's uh, 10.35. Okay. So, okay. So before I move to that, are there any questions about, about what, I, what, what I've shown or, or? Okay. So let's talk about cross-validation and regularization. So you've seen like recently, there has been a lot of hype about the use of machine learning and statistical learning and different things. So, so I said, I, I wanna do some of that as well. So, so, so what we try to do is use some statistical learning techniques to improve the way we can do mortality more. 
So, so this starts with some questions that I think you, you, they might also come up with what we discussed already. So if we have different applications, we might want to use different models. So for instance, you might use a projection model to get a projection for the mortality of the next year. But if you are a demographic institute, you might want to get a projection for the next 30, 30 years or 50 years. And the question is, should you use the same model? Maybe not. Maybe the model that performs well for short-term projections is different to the one that performs well for long-term projections. And also, when doing mortality models, why do we always use a fixed set of models? So you saw that I started with four models. Why don't I start with a bigger set of models? And how can I be confident that the model I use is the best for the application I have at hand? So with that, what we try to do over the past two years, extending some MOM and other techniques, is to develop a framework for constructing, selecting, and evaluating mortality models using the statistical learning techniques. So in terms of construction, we use that based on regularization techniques. So if you were at the keynote, this is related to the lasso and the elastic net that we saw in the, in the very first talk of the, of the session. And then we can do also the selection using cross-validation. So let's see. Let's talk about selection. So if you want to select a mortality model, so we can use uh, the standard tools from, from a statistical learning. So if I have my data, which is by age and year, maybe I want to split it into training and testing set. But I need to do it wisely because my data is time order, right? So what we do is we can say, okay, say I want to get a projection for the next three years. So I can leave out three years of data, right? Use the other data to get a projection of the red line, right? But then I can move it and leave out three different years of data and then project the next three, three years, right? But if I wanted to do it for, say, 10 years, then I will leave not three years, but 10 years. So to mimic how I'm gonna use it later, right? So that's what we've implemented, right? And we can evaluate that using the mean square error. Okay. So let's see how you implement that in St. Mom, right? So let's say I wanna evaluate it for a one year ahead forecast. So this is already available in the development version. So if you wanna use that, then you need to Instead of installing it how you installed it before, you need to install it using these tools, which will install this particular version of, of, of the package, right? So that, then what I will do is I have a Lee Carter model. I want to cross-validate it, but I want to use it only using one year ahead forecast. Again, I want to use data for US mail. I'm going to fit it to the same years, the the, the, the same ages and the same years, and I want to compute the MSC, the mean square error, on the log rates. I might want to use it all, I might want to do it all, all also on the rates, but in this case, I'm going to do it on the log rates. I can do the same for the others, and I can get a number of the cross validation error. I can also do it for 10 year ahead forecast, saying that I'm going to use it for longer term, so I do the same but using H equal to 10, right? So let's see what we get. So we get for the Lee Carter, the cross-validation MSC is this number for the 10 year ahead. It's this different number. Notice that this is bigger. Normally when we forecast longer, the error we make is bigger. And let's see what we get for the different models. So here I have the criterions that I had before, AIC, BIC, and cross-validation error for different horizons. So recall that using goodness of fit uh, information criteria, we got that the M7 was the best model, right? Not surprisingly, if we want to do just one year ahead projections, that's fine because, because this is sort of doing in-sample fitting, right? So again, this, the M7 is the one that performs the best. But if we want to do 10 year ahead projections, that model is not the best anymore, right? It seems like a simpler model might be better. And then this is something that is, it is known in, 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 in when, when you're doing forecasting. Typically, the longer you want to forecast, the simpler models tends to behave, the better. Not, maybe not the more simple, but sometimes simpler is better than more complex. So this suggests that the APC, and some empirical studies that we've done, this seems to happen for most populations. Right? Okay. So this is, I think, something that, that, that might be useful for, for, for projections. So now, let's go to the construction part. So, so far, 
what I show you is how you fit a single set of models. So you have the APC, the Lee Carter, the CVD, and the M7. But if we have the, a, the, the generalized HP core framework, we could try even bigger models, right? We don't need to have this number of, param of, of time trends to be three. It could be 20, it could be 1,000, right? So what I can say, I'm going to try to fit a huge model. So it would be a model not with, not with two or three terms, but say with 10 terms. So I can fit a model where you have all of these terms, right? So it would be with 100 time trends. But then the question is, if I have 100 time trends, I'm going to overfit my data, right? So I need to pick which of these time trends or evolutions do I need to include. And I can do that using cross-validation. So for that, there are some theoretical results that, 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 that are useful, which is that you can rewrite all of these models as GLMs. So if you can rewrite them as GLMs, then you can use all the machinery that is available for GLMs. In particular, there is a very useful tool, which is the group lasso, which allows you to do automatic selection of group parameters. So it's similar to what we saw in, in the first keynote, where, where you, had, you needed to select with which which of the, character of the places in the DNA will explain the, 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 the methods, the, the, what was the name? Methylated DNA. Exactly. So it, it, it's exactly the same, the same technique. And that's already implemented in a package in R, so I can reuse it. So let's see what you get. So when you do regularization, what you do is you do a minimization of the residual sum of squares, but with a penalization. And then the degree of penalization will depend on a parameter. You say, I, I want to penalize less, I want to penalize more. So that parameter is usually called lambda. So let's have it here. So if you penalize your model a lot, what you get is a very simple model, right? So in our case, what you will get is just an alpha x. So the simple model I can get is I just capture the h shape, right? As I can afford to have more complex models, I would start capturing some of the trends, right? So I can capture, I can say like, okay, maybe I should have this parameter in. So the one that just captures how mortality evolves parallelly for all ages, right? So if you do that, then as you change the complexity, then what you get, okay, I need a time trend, right? But then if you make it even more complex, what you get, I may need a linear trend, right? And then, Maybe also a cubic tra a, 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 a trend of four order, and then maybe later a cohort effect, right? So this will be like a family or a path of models, and then depending on your application, you might place yourself at different places in this path, right? Let's see. It might be clearer if we see how that this will be in terms of fitted traits, right? So if you have a very simple model, what you will have is just Okay, I'm just saying the mortality is just the average over time. As I change it, it will be okay. Now I'm capturing the trends, but everything is moving in parallel. But we know that different ages are improving at different paces. So when I make it more complex, then you see I start capturing more of the things that happen at particular ages. And if I make it even more complex, then I capture the different, the different details of every age. And then at the end, I might just overfit the data. So now you can do this in Senmomo. So to do that, again, we need to define a model. In this case, we define a very big model. I mean, this is not too big, but say with 16 terms. And then I want to pick which of the 16 terms will, will, will appear. And then to do that, I just need to, to do the fitting. But now I don't use the fit, but the group fit of the model is exactly the same. And then I can get the different paths. So this will be the simplest a more complex one, an even more complex one, and then you can select the best model using cross-validation techniques. I won't show that here. So, so let me just show the last two slides about improvement rate modeling, which is another important thing. So one key development in, 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 mortality, in mortality modeling recently is like a lot of people have been looking at improvement rates. In particular in the UK, the new CMI model, what it does, it is fit an APC model, but not to the mortality rates, but to the improvement rates. And the improvement rates are defined in terms of the, uh, of the log, of the, log of, the D, of the ratio between the rates in one year and the previous year. And then you assume 
that you have an alpha x, kappa t, and gamma t x. So there are some theoretical things that you can do to show that this model is equivalent to a mortality model, but, but that's, that, that, that's not important at this time. But in the other package that, that we've developed that is not yet publicly available, but it's, I, I hope to release it in the next six months, also because the SOA need, for another project we're doing, we're using it a lot for, for, for understanding trends in the, in, the, in the US. So you can define an APCI model. So this will be a model where the predictor is alpha x, kappa one, gamma t, and then I can fit it exactly in the same way. So I wanna fit the APCI model to the US using this, but then the parameters that you get, you can plot them, but they have very different interpretations, right? So now, this alpha x will represent the average improvement rate over age. So this will be, at age 60, the average improvement rate has been about 1.4 per year, and it's been slower at older ages. So you see, you normally see this when you see life tables, uh, improvement, improvement scales that, 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 that people produce. And then the kappa t will show how uh, 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 in time, whether improvement rates have been slower or faster. So you notice here, so this will be the zero line. So you notice that from 2010, this is negative. So this means that improvement rates have been, in some cases even, mortality has been worsening. And then for the, for the cohort effects, it's not easy to see here, but if you draw a zero line here, you see that this cohort have a positive improvement rate relative to the rest. Right. And you can do the same for other or more complex improvement rate models. Okay, so, so thank you. If you, if you want to follow the development of the package so everything is publicly available on CRAN, so you can see the code, the implementation, and if you find issues, just tell me, because there is always problems with, with coding. Also, if you have suggestions about things that might be useful for, in, in, if, you, if you use it, that, 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 that you might want to have in, in, in the package, I, I put in my to-do list if, 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 I, if I think it's something that might be useful for, for everyone. So, so that's it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Yeah. I'd like to take this opportunity to draw any comments uh, or new learnings that you have found as useful to you, you can share with us, or questions. Take care, to be interactive. Yeah, thank you, Andres. For, for me personally, just want to make sure that we can do it within time. You have five minutes. For me personally, I think this is uh, an empowering tool. I remember that my first um, Living to 100 conference, one of my presentation was to answer the question of what was the uh, mortality improvement rates in the States? Because at that point, if you remember, we, uh, the US used to have an AA table and, and for some ages, the annual rate of mortality improvement was 0.7%. And then I asked, what, does it match your historical rates? And you know, we don't know, maybe yes, maybe not. So, but we had the data, HMD data and social security data. What was lacking at that time to me was a tool to actually work it out. And what we, I was fortunate at that time was uh, uh, was there was a propriety software. There's no other tools that let me do it. I think there's some academic, uh, they all write their own program, clever program that I don't have access to. With that tool, I was able to work out the historical rate was about 2.2%, and then this table says 0.7%, so you're, we are under-reserving. So that, that starts a uh, lot of debate, and eventually the US did uh, change the assumptions. So that, to me, this, the, the need of a tool, the lack of a tool, means that we were, uh, we were quite helpless and, and couldn't do much. So I'm quite encouraged by your development, which takes us to the next step, which is you have a tool that is moving, evolving, and available to everybody. I remember when I had that tool, I didn't even buy it because I couldn't get you know, uh, the company to sign off this new software and tender to buy it. I have to get a favor from the who is my friend, who say, okay, you can use it just for this conference. Uh, and then there was new questions, say, all right, what about this country? What about you've done US, what about that country? 
and then I have to run the tools, I get favor again, and, and I say, you forgot the Netherlands, which is a big call, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, and, and uh, with a tool like this right now, it's, um, and with a different models, what we've found is that different models fit different countries. Yeah. Um, so we can, uh, the, the more recent question is that the slowdown in mortality improvements, so I get asked, I work in the UK, so is the UK, is it only a UK problem? Is it US and, uh, and, and others? Then I'll, I'll call somebody up and do US work. They say, yeah, we have slowed down, but we used uh, HMD up to this different year. We, we smoothed it a different way. I call up my Canadian friend. Oh, we don't do reduction. We do life expectancy rise. They do flatten out. So as a result, I need to pull different results of different people for different purposes to draw a conclusion that yes, there's perhaps a slowdown. What would be more powerful is that we have the HMD data. If you have a tool, you just smooth them consistently. You can explain them. Uh, if they don't like that model, okay, okay, switch to a different model and to draw a conclusion whether there's a slowdown in mortality improvements. And of course, you have somebody who has a favorite country they did it slow down in Spain? I come from Spain, I want to know about it. Well, with this tool, you can say, you're going to do it yourself, right? Yeah. Um, so thank you for your, for your presentation. I think you have uh, progressed the, it has the potential to help progress the actual profession uh, when something that is made uh, widely available, more people can analyze things in different way and we can serve uh, our clients and also our stakeholders better. Thank you. Keep us in touch. Okay, thank you. All right.